well, I said I wanted to do another installment of this series, and the last one didn't do too bad in terms of viewership, so screw it, here we are. I don't have too too much to say about the format, you all know how this works, I'm going to be reviewing every album in the sub mucor section of this chart, starting with the first row right now. The only change in format to note is that I forgot last time to rank the albums at the end, which resulted in the end of the video being pretty abrupt. If you want to see my ranking of those ones, I'll throw it up on screen right now, and without further ado, let's talk Radiohead. What the hell am I even supposed to say about OK Computer? Is there anything else left to say? It is quite possibly the most well-regarded album ever made, up there with classics like Abbey Road, Dark Side of the Moon, Ziggy Stardust. It's been consistently the highest rated album on the site Rate Your Music for years and shows no signs of moving anytime soon. It's been influential on incalculable numbers of artists in all mediums and genres, and took rock music to places it hadn't been on such a visible scale before. It is, unquestionably, one of the most important records to ever release. So what do I think about it? Well, I'll get it out of the way now, it's not my favorite album, not even my favorite Radiohead album, but it's a damn incredible one that, despite its unprecedented acclaim, I would still struggle to even call overrated. It's not the Radiohead album I gravitate towards the most these days, but it absolutely has been in the past, and that history with this record is hard to deny as a massive influence on my music taste now. I can't even remember the first time I heard this record. It's one of those ones that was constantly around the house growing up, and that makes it really hard to have anything close to an objective view of the record. But hey, I've never strived for that before, and I'm not starting now. In the last episode, I talked about Radiohead's alien masterpiece in Kid A, and I think it's hard to deny that OK Computer was a glimpse into that world we'd grow so familiar with in the future. It takes the band's previous alt-rock roots and expands the scope exponentially, both outwards and inwards. Previously, tracks like Street Spirit had displayed the deeply personal and musically compelling direction the band's music could go, but on OK Computer, that's nearly every track. Take the song Climbing Up the Walls, for example. It takes the isolated sadness of Street Spirit and evolves it into a devastating deep dive into mental health with this raw and smoky instrumental culminating in an explosive finale putting almost anything else the band had put out to shame. That's just one track, too, and not even one of the biggest ones. Karma Police is this beautiful piano ballad that takes on the state's unquestionable authority over the people it claims to protect, and the people who abuse that dangerous power for their own convenience. No Surprises digs into a melancholy place of sadness with its all-too-sweet guitar line and glockenspiel disguising the truly devastating lyrical content. And we can't go without talking about Paranoid Android, which could aptly be described as the Bohemian Rhapsody of the 90s, with its length, sonic variety and progression, theatricality, and of course its social commentary. That's the thing that makes OK Computer stand out, as well as keeping it forever relevant. The message of the record, one of anti-corporate, anti-authoritarian distrust of the ways that technology can be used against the average person by some unknowable other only get more and more relevant as we lose more and more of our privacy to the likes of Facebook and Google, and despite how interconnected we all are, that digital loneliness abundant in both the lyrics and the sound of the record resonate now more than ever. OK Computer is consistently excellent, with not a single dud track in sight, and more than enough classics to support its own weight. It's cliche, but this album's a 10, and one I will likely never stop returning to. Hmm. So, remember last time when I said Kid A was my favorite Radiohead album? Yeah, about that. Kid A is still, to me, a perfect album, but recently something about In Rainbows has started clicking with me a lot more, and 
I'm gonna do my best here to define it. See, everyone loves In Rainbows, but I find that a lot of the time when I try to figure out why everyone loves it so much, they also seem to struggle putting words to the record's sound. And I don't think that's unintentional. The instrumentation, vocals, and production on this record are immaculate, easily some of the best I've ever heard. But when I think about In Rainbows, that's not what comes to mind. Instead, I feel this gut-level emotional response, unlike anything else. I feel this sense of longing, of loneliness, but of hope and passion as well. True to its name, In Rainbows feels like the most colorful and expressive record the band ever put out. It's touching to see a band so deep in their career put so much heart into a project like this, one that's so quaint and intimate compared to the material they were famous for. And when I say quaint, I mean it strictly relative to the rest of the band's discography. We don't get the shrieking cacophony of a My Iron Lung or the gritty anger of Myxomatosis. Instead, the swelling beauty is more subtle and close, with intricate string symphonies and clean guitars laden in reverb rather than distortion. The closest thing we get to that energy is Body Snatchers, and while that's definitely a banger, even that has a softer side to it in the bridge that ties it in and makes it feel like an essential piece of the tracklist. And that brings up the other thing that blows me away within Rainbows, its tracklist. I mentioned earlier that for me there isn't a single dud on OK Computer, but I could definitely hear a case for something like electioneering not being the most fitting inclusion. On In Rainbows, though, I couldn't even meet you halfway on any of these tracks. They're all perfect. 15 Step, with its propulsive 5-4 time signature, sucks us right in, but it's also one of the only moments of electronic instruments on the entire record, easing us into the concept of a Radiohead return to its roots, but in a much more matured form. From there, it's just classic track after classic track, with the beautiful tragedy of Nude, the driving distorted bass of All I Need, the echoey sweetness of House of Cards, and the massive climax of Jigsaw falling into place. All of it culminates in Radiohead's saddest and most personal track to date in videotape. The repeated piano chords over the growing, exaggerated echo on the drums feels like losing grip on everything around you and just slipping into the abyss. Every time I listen to In Rainbows, I'm left in total disbelief at the sheer majesty of it all. It's truly a once-in-a-lifetime achievement that I unironically feel like a better person for having heard. Of course it's a 10, there's no question. There's something to be said about an album like this, one that defies most definitions and stands alone as something totally singular, and its relationship to the review format. Death Consciousness, in particular, has had a long history of hilariously pretentious attempts to categorize and pin down its sound, and unfortunately, it looks like I'm about to become the next addition to that list. In sound, Death Consciousness is about as dark as it gets. In a way, it reminds me of some of the darker, ambient tracks on Akira Yamaoka's Silent Hill soundtracks. It's vast and ill-defined a large amount of the time. Droning passages of truly desolate soundscape fill the cracks between the musical ideas. Those song segments take influence from post-punk in structure, but I wouldn't say this is a post-punk album at all. Even in that genre's darkest moments with acts like Joy Division and The Cure, there's always a deep-rooted danceability that keeps it approachable. You can sometimes find traces of that here, the drums on Holy Fucking Shit and the guitar riff on Waiting for Black Metal Records, but they sit in the shadow of the dark cloud that is the record's concept. One of the record's other sonic comparisons is often shoegaze, which I consider to be accurate, but for totally different reasons than the likes of My Bloody Valentine. 
Loveless in particular got its hazy, undefined sound palette by way of half a million dollars and the death of its label. Death Consciousness, on the other hand, gets its similarly undefined sound by way of a sub $1,000 budget and losing the masters halfway through recording. It's almost the quintessential lo-fi story, but somehow it manages to be produced incredibly well. Almost all of it was recorded through a laptop mic, and you can kind of tell, but whatever effects they used in post absolutely make the record and give it this hazy underwater feel rather than a jagged crunchy one. I don't have too much to say about the concept or lyrics of the record, except that this line here comes back to me and plays in my head all the time. But. There's a vibe here that's just conveyed immaculately. That vibe is just the deepest, saddest form of depression imaginable. It's like a nightmare, but the kind that you realize and take some form of strange solace in, rather than waking up. The vocals are hidden 90% of the time, which gives it this claustrophobic, drowning feeling that doesn't quite go away and after a while begins to feel oddly comforting. like. Maybe I'm alone, but at least there's some beauty in solitude. So yeah, this record is fantastic and completely unique. For a personal score, I'd probably give it a 9, but more so I would say everyone should just try and listen to it at least once because it's an experience you won't really get anywhere else. Now, I'll say it right out the gate, this was probably the hardest record to write about for this video. Not because it's taxing in any way, but because frankly, I didn't think I had anything to say. I actually took a very long hiatus from this script because I was struggling so hard trying to find anything to write. But when I finally decided to say fuck it and start writing nearly two months later, I actually found there was a bunch hiding in there. I'll get it out of the way and say that I don't think this record is perfect and I don't really have a ton of personal attachment to it, but I think despite some issues, it's a great record with a lot to love. To start, the thing that always takes my breath away is the production and instrumentation going on at all times. Right away on the first track, we're shown the breadth of this record's sound, beginning with a pling sound reminiscent of Pink Floyd's echoes and evolving gradually and seamlessly into this majestic scene laid out with a sweeping low end, soaring vocal layers, and reverb laden cymbals that loosely tie it into a cohesive whole. It's truly spectacular, and it only continues onto the next track, which gives up a majority of the last track's instrumentation in favor of this truly gorgeous string section underpinning the vocal melodies that croon on. Past this point, we get yet another taste of one of my personal favorite aspects of the album, which is the bass. When I think about this record, the first thing to come to mind is the keyboard bass line on track 6, Bam Bam Bam, but even more impressive in the moment is the thick, plodding bass lines that envelop the mixes of tracks 4 and 8, as well as many others throughout. The other instrumental slash production technique that shows up on nearly every track here is this cacophonous, shoegaze-esque wall of reverb-drenched feedback that loops into itself in tandem with the songs, giving it this larger-than-life feeling that is genuinely awe-inspiring. So why, if I love so much about these tracks, did I say I'm not quite sure I get this record? Well, it's two things, really. First, and far less damningly, but still worth bringing up, I'm not always into the vocals here. For the most part, they're fantastic, and they ride some excellent material for most of the track list, but there's generally at least one moment per track that doesn't quite hit me the way I think it's intended, and I think for as good as the performance is on the last two tracks, 
The title track mixes the vocals way too high in a way that I find jarring, and the opposite is true on the closer, Avalon, which is drowned out in distortion in a way that I understand what they were aiming for, but doesn't quite hit the mark for me. The more notable issue I have is actually going to sound pretty rich coming from me, but it's the length and pacing of some of these tracks, as well as the record itself. Now, obviously it's a post-rock album, so of course it's going to be long and patient, but I do find there are definitely some times on certain tracks that I just feel are a little drawn out. The one that especially comes to mind is track 3, which, while I praised the sound of the vocals over the strings earlier in the review, I actually find it to be a bit of a drag for the last 2 or 3 minutes of its nearly 7 minute runtime. The individual songs aren't actually my main issue though. I think the actual reason I struggle with this record is the overall pacing of the tracklist. Obviously, with each track being this long, it can be hard not to feel like things are starting to drag, but honestly, I think with a little bit of rearranging and maybe a little more ruthless of an editing down process, this record could have been pared down to a nearly perfect 50 or so minutes. As it stands, the record feels like a collection of excellent tracks with a similar vibe, but I guess I've come to expect a more tangible through line in my post-rock that this record doesn't quite have. With all that said, this is still a fantastic record that is obviously a classic and well worth a peep if you've liked anything you've heard so far. I think nearly every track here is excellent, and while I do wish it was a bit better paced overall, I don't think it's rough enough to detract too much from this beautiful work. I feel like an 8 is appropriate for this one, still an extremely hearty recommendation. boy. Alright. You all know how much I love Skinny Fists. I think it should come as no surprise then how much I also love this record. I mean, Godspeed is my favorite band, I think essentially every record they've made is excellent, and this is easily one of their most acclaimed to date. The record essentially sparked a new wave of post-rock, now both lovingly and mockingly labeled as Crescendo Core. And while there's certainly an element of truth to the somewhat generic nature of their imitators, I think it's worth establishing again that Godspeed has imitators for a reason. They truly did make innovations in the genre that broke new ground and crafted a timeless sound even to this day. So what's different about Godspeed's debut from the record that came after? Well, for one, it's darker. Right from the very first minute, we're enveloped in this brooding drone as a man's voice tells us the tales of the apocalypse, of the failures and ultimate end state of capitalism. He speaks of a wallet full of blood, a car on fire with no driver at the wheel, of being trapped in the belly of a machine that's bleeding to death. Godspeed obviously never stopped being political, but it's striking here how immediately and aggressively pointed their message is on F-sharp A-sharp. With every field recording, we're given a more and more detailed painting of this apocalyptic world not too far away from our own. At the beginning of the third and final track here, we get Blaze Bailey Finnegan III, who makes an even greater appearance on Godspeed's subsequent EP, speaking about the unceremonious and gradual end of the world that we were ignoring and still continue to ignore now. And so, with a message as powerful and as urgent as that, of course the music would reflect it with a sound that is not so dissimilar to what the band would do down the line, but is pointedly more gloomy, more cacophonous, and far more ominous. The core movement of East Hastings, titled The Sad Mafioso, 
is this single repeating clean minor key guitar line playing a slow and measured loop. As more and more elements build like pieces into this puzzle, the difference between this and Skinny Fists becomes clear. A similar movement on Skinny Fists would feel magical, like ascending, like my mind is reaching some new heights of understanding. On F sharp A sharp, the exact same formula elicits a far more guttural response. I feel like I've seen something I shouldn't, like I'm an animal in a cage waiting for something to happen but not knowing if it ever will. For a long time, when I was getting into this record, I had gripes with its production. I felt like it was disappointing after having heard the immaculate sounds of Skinny Fists, but upon critical re-examination, it's become quickly apparent that F Sharp A Sharp is just doing something else entirely, something far more in line with the grittier, more flawed sound of its recording. By being a little more lo-fi, it may lack some of the transcendental, mind-expanding moments of Skinny Fists, but what it gains is this more revolutionary, boots-on-the-ground aesthetic to its political activism. It's dark and it's gritty, but most importantly, it's a piece of political art. It's relatable. And with that, I think it's only fair that I give this a 10. I still do prefer Skinny Fists, obviously, but it's not by that wide of a margin, and frankly, there are still days where I'm more inclined to listen to this record than that one. It's another absolute masterpiece by my favorite band of all time. It's interesting that I'm talking about this record directly after the Sigur Row one, because in a lot of ways, that record only really exists because of Talk Talk's records, Spirit of Eden, and of course, Laughingstock. See, back in the early 90s, when post-rock was starting to find its legs for the first time, the genre was very distinctly split between two sounds. On one hand, you had the dark, mathy dirge of records like Slint's Spiderland, and on the other was a more orchestral and even jazz-influenced sound that you'd find on records like this one. By the end of the decade, we would see them coalesce into something more uniform like we see now, with records like Soundtracks and Godspeed's material really cementing what post-rock means. But it's always fascinating to see the dual approaches to what post-rock could have meant in its origin. And so we have Laughingstock, essentially a direct sequel to the very first post-rock album. It takes the wide and at times cacophonous range of instrumentation that Spirit of Eden brought to the fray and stretches it out to its limits. The tracks here drone on more, they're a lot more patient, and the mixes in particular have a much more intimate attention to detail. It's easy to get lost in the waves of tiny instrumental flourishes throughout this record. The songs are really quite excellent as well, with the first few tracks in particular being a massive standout. Over the course of nearly 10 minutes, After the Flood explores every nook and cranny of its instrumental ideas while never outstaying its welcome, with lush organ solos contrasting noisy walls of feedback elsewhere in the song. Ascension Day has an energy to it that calls back in large part to the more immediate and structured form of Spirit of Eden and Taphead, despite being so relatively simple and going for so long, barely feels its length at nearly 8 minutes. The vocals are also a great standout on this record. I'm genuinely quite picky with vocals in my post-rock, since to me the genre has always been defined by its instrumental structures more than anything else. Mark Hollis's voice, though, is a perfect fit for the record. His range is impressive, not just in tone, but also in volume and timbre, maintaining the sense of breathy calm and space present in the rest of the instrumentation without getting lost in the fray. I do have my gripes with the record as well. I think Newgrass in particular overstays its welcome, and while I do really enjoy the innovation and importance of how slow and drawn out the sound is. I do still think I prefer the sheer amount of stuff going on with Spirit of Eden a bit more. This one sits pretty solidly at an 8 for me. Still a very important record though for 
one of my most beloved genres. In a similar way to how last time I wasn't sure I got Loveless, I was kind of in the same place with Slow Dive Souvlaki for a long time. The only difference here is I always knew I loved Souvlaki. In fact, when I first listened to the two records, I actually preferred this one a fair bit. As time has gone on and I've grown a greater appreciation of Loveless, that has changed a bit, but in recent months my growing love of Dream Pop has definitely started evening the scales. I think one of the things that has always intrigued me about this record is that I was never sure whether I should call it shoegaze or a dream pop record. The distinction between those two genres is already fairly thin, but I don't think any record blurs those lines more than this one. From the howling feedback and blizzard-thick distortion and reverb on Suvlaki's space station to the tonally subdued but sonically suffocating machine gun, the songs all fit cleanly in the trappings of dream pop, but the production often leans hard in a claustrophobic and shoegazy direction that gives otherwise rather floaty and soft songs a serious weight to them. Even the less shoegazy tracks here really feel like something special as well. A lot of that is thanks to the beautiful contrast between Neil Halstead and Rachel Goswell's vocals. Even when I can't understand what they're saying, just the way they sing together is enough to get me fully invested. And while I do think Rachel is a bit underutilized on this project, the record still succeeds on every front here. Well, I don't think I prefer it to Loveless anymore. I think the race between that record and Suvlaki is incredibly close, and it very much relies on my mood which one I'd rather listen to. It's a landmark release in what's growing to be one of my favorite genres, period, and I have no issue recommending it to anyone, no matter their taste. A 9 from me. I cannot tell you just how excited I am to finally be talking about Bjork on this channel. Maybe it's a normie take, but I genuinely consider her to be one of the greatest living artists of our time. With a heaping handful of masterpieces under her belt, this absolutely being one of them. I definitely want to do a full video on her discography on the whole at some point, and we'll be putting some time aside to hopefully make that in the near future, but for right now, let's talk about the most dramatic dive into electronic music she'd yet made. Up to this point, Bjork had partaken in some pretty excellent experimentation on post, while still maintaining a danceable and approachable quality like on debut. By 1997 though, even the house music framework that the previous records had been built on was starting to grow stale, and it was pretty obvious that to stay on the cutting edge, Bjork would have to do something radical, and so she did. Taking cues from acts like Aphex Twin, Autekker, and Massive Attack, she dove headfirst into a more IDM and trip-hop infused style generously mixing in her own unmistakable personality into it, and, of course, her iconic vocals as well. The result on Homogenic is the sacrifice of the house-influenced danceability of her previous material at the hand of sheer atmosphere. It's the frigid Icelandic peaks, it's the waters off the coast, it's the green valleys that sprawl in every direction. There's a true wonder about the whole record, a fascination with life at a conceptual level, and I think it's telling that the one divulgence back into house and techno is on the track Pluto, which is about as jarring, alien, and disconnected as the track list gets. Meanwhile, the rest of the tracklist plays around in its subtleties, with the emotional responses coming from far more intimate and quiet places. It's the slight strings that open All Is Full of Love, underpinned with a grinding bass tone far down in the mix. It's the muted drums that draw forth the chorus of Unravel. All throughout the record, Bjork shows an undeniable mastery of restraint and of the intricacies of building a soundscape. The passion is 
perhaps most visible in her vocal performance throughout the album. I consider the track Five Years to be probably her best performance across her discography with growls, hums, hisses, and just the purest demonstration of her range, but even aside from the obvious in-your-face moments like that and Alarm Call, the softer moments like on Unravel and Hunter build up a range of emotions on the project that is unique across her whole career, and with such a powerful and emotive voice behind every track, it's impossible not to be sucked in. And so with that, of course, I think this record is a 10. It's an absolute masterclass of everything it does and was so clearly influential on music down the line. This thing came out three years before Kid A and did some of that shit first for Christ's sake. Gushing is over, look forward to more Bjork content from me in the future. I didn't do any kind of grand research for this statement or anything, but by my estimate, this has got to be the most universally popular album on this chart. And for good reason, I mean, it's fucking Nevermind, are you kidding me? You don't need me to tell you that this is the record that changed everything. It signaled the end of the glam era and the beginning of grunge as a mainstream movement. Grunge music had obviously existed before this point, Nirvana, and especially Kurt Cobain, took great inspiration from acts like Mudhoney and Sonic Youth when they were building up their sound, but never had it been so refined as on Nevermind. It was the tightest the genre had ever been, the best produced the genre had ever been, and by far the most commercially successful. And in some ways, I think that could have been a detractor for me, if only to a small degree. For grunge and punk purists, it absolutely is, but frankly, the more I age past my elitist phase of thinking, oh, it's gotta be abrasive or it sucks, the more I come to accept that, yes, Nirvana's Nevermind is a masterpiece that deserves the mass acclaim it's received. So let's talk about the music here, and frankly, I don't even know where to start. Side A of this record is literally untouchable with classic after classic after classic after classic. The furthest thing in the first six tracks from a smash hit is Polly, and that's all you should need to know to understand the record's classic status. For as much as we joke about it, the edgy teenager's first favorite song, Smells Like Teen Spirit, is undeniably a phenomenal song, and as an opener, it completely undoes any worries one could have had about giving Nirvana a production budget. It's loud, it's anthemic, it does everything you'd want a grunge single to do, and for that it literally changed the entire cultural landscape of the decade. It truly is the song of a generation. Beyond that, singles like In Bloom, Come As You Are, and Lithium all carry on that perfect and iconic songwriting the band would become known for. Drain You is by far my favorite in this camp, with its mildly discomforting lyrics and that sick, practically ambient bridge that sounds like being sucked down a pipe or swallowed. Breed has also been another all-time favorite for me, being one of the first songs I ever learned on guitar, with this blistering energy and a great sounding but stupid simple guitar solo that Kurt kinda made his trademark. That leads me to some of the more interesting material on here for me, which is the entirety of Side B. Territorial Pissings immediately kicks us into gear with a freakish rendition of the Youngbloods' Get Together, followed by some of the most ear-blistering distortion and power chord feedback on the whole record. Kurt's vocal performance here is freakish and animalistic in a way it rarely even was on Bleach, and we see this again on Stay Away. As we close the record out though, we get a very different side of the band that has stuck with listeners for decades since. On a Plane is this beautiful alt-rock track that really shows some of the musical talents that the band on the whole possessed. Raw energy aside, they could absolutely write a flawless song. But it's on the closer, Something in the Way, that we really get the truly raw stuff. 
Stripping away the layers of anger and distortion reveals a version of Kurt that is honestly telling in hindsight. A down-tune and out-of-tune acoustic guitar is the sole underpinning for the practically mumbled ruminations of someone possibly predicting the devastating effect the choice to go mainstream would have on his own life trajectory. It's the calm before the storm of touring and public appearances, and as the strings subtly build in the back, it serves as a tragic closer for the record that changed everything. It's a 9 out of 10 for me. It doesn't hold as much personal impact as other records and performances from the band, but to pretend it's anything less than a masterpiece and a classic would be stupid. Again, it's fucking never mind. Three years after Nevermind, everything changed. The record's success and the endless touring that followed were, by all accounts, devastating to Kurt Cobain's mental health, and while in 1992 he did end up getting married and having a daughter with fellow musician Courtney Love, it was tumultuous and his growing addictions made up a roadblock in many aspects of his life. These compiling issues mixed with the unprecedented and unwanted level of fame that never seemed to slow, led ultimately to the conclusion that, by this point we all know, on April 5th, 1994, Kurt Cobain shot himself in his home in Seattle, Washington, just months after the release of In Utero. He was just 27 years old. This record, more than any other in their short discography, lives totally in the shadow of Kurt's story. The man behind Nevermind was clearly not a happy one, but in retrospect it's still easy to see light shining through the cracks in that record. You'll find no such light on In Utero. The more polished and professional sounds that made Nevermind's singles such hits is all but gone on this record. In its place is something primal and animalistic, something unkempt and demoralized to the point of unrecognizability. I wouldn't even compare this record to Bleach because for as raw and energetic as that record was, it still had a great sense of fun behind it. In Utero, while you can tell the musicians behind it are enjoying the music they're making, I would struggle to say it sounds like there's much fun being had in the writing and recording process. Kurt was fighting for his fucking life here, and that's more than apparent in the recordings we got. The easiest example of this is right early on. The second track, Scentless Apprentice, is this shredding monster of a track, maybe my favorite the band ever did. It has a riff not dissimilar to Alice in Chains' Them Bones, but instead of that track's crushing low-end heaviness, Nirvana's is a whirlwind of shrieks, sloppy and emotive walls of guitar distortion and feedback, and a drumline so powerful it would outshine most instrumentals off Nevermind if it was placed in them. Even on the lead single of the record, Heart Shaped Box, we're operating in a much darker and more visceral space than on any of Nevermind's hits, with a relatively standard soft loud soft progression made so much more by Kurt's nonsensical but very visual lyrics. Lines like, I wish I could eat your cancer when you turn black, and throw down your umbilical noose so I can climb right back, leave no mystery as to the headspace Kurt was in writing the lyrics, and again show the knack he had for poetry in the abstract. One of the most interesting tracks to me is the track Rape Me, a confrontational track that simultaneously comments on the culture of consequence-free assault we're just now seeing a reckoning for, as well as Kurt's own experience with the music industry and the way it would violate and ultimately destroy him. The track is very openly a tie-in to Smells Like Teen Spirit with a nearly identical riff and song structure, and the sheer poignancy of basically remaking your most famous song and releasing it as a single under the title of Rape Me is seriously powerful messaging that definitely went over my head as a 14-year-old Nirvana fan. 
Again, most of this record is this animalistic spew, especially as the record draws on with very ape, milkit, and Tourette's, but it's once again the softest moments that are the most telling here. Dumb is one of the best tracks, with just a simple clean guitar and Kurt's vocals underpinned with the lightest of strings. The lyrics are as self-deprecating as they come, with more overt references to his addictions than most elsewhere on the record. Penny Royal T is another one that takes a more subdued approach, with fantastic results. It's clearly a reference to the drink used as an abortifacient, one often used as a last result that Kurt is metaphorically using to numb himself every day. And of course we close with All Apologies. It's the final track on any of their studio albums, so of course it's been examined to death, torn inside out, and scraped clean for meaning by listeners. I think though, the track is best taken on its face. Kurt's here, he doesn't know what the thousands of faces staring at him want from him, and he can't stand the guilt of not being able to satiate everyone who wanted everything that he couldn't give. In retrospect, it almost reads as a suicide note, and while we will obviously never know for sure, I think there's no question that it's a powerful track and the perfect closer to not only the record, but the band's career. I don't know what else to say, really. It's a super strong nine for me for whatever that means, and it's definitely one of the most important records for anyone into music on the whole. It's fantastic. You'll start to notice a trend here as we round out this row of records. It's not overly subtle, but I think it's worth pointing out. The entire last third of this episode is about albums made by artists who tragically died incredibly young. The musical stylings of the four records are all quite different, but their placement together feels very intentional. Elliot Smith is commonly regarded as one of the all-time great singer-songwriters, paired often with the likes of Nick Drake in terms of the sad man crooner crowd. There are a fair few comparisons you could make between the two musically, but I think the obvious one a lot of people lean right into is the fact that they both made sad music and then killed themselves. I feel like that's reductive though, and it does no justice to the musical careers either musician had and the legacy their careers leave even aside from their deaths. In particular, the case with Elliot Smith feels bizarre to me because for the genre, his music is actually far more positive than some of his contemporaries. Either or may see him at a point of bitter unhappiness, but there's no overwrought poetic flourish to his misery like you might hear from Morrissey, nor is there the heavy-handed doom and gloom like from Ian Curtis. Instead it's more intentionally mundane, letting the sadness bleed through the cracks, perpetuating in the everyday that Smith sings about here. It's in this way that I think the record's influence is most notable. Without Elliot Smith, we wouldn't ever have our Phoebe Bridgers, our Julian Bakers, or our Mitskis. The entire sad girl indie movement is essentially wholly predicated on the fact that this record blew up and the fact that, for as simple as the style is, it was the one that he practically invented and perfected across his short but important career. As for the music on here, I don't necessarily have a ton to say in specific, and I don't think that's a criticism of the record in the slightest. I think that for as much dissection you could do of the lyrical meanings behind every song, tearing apart every lyrical idea to find some truer meaning, I think you're far better served just absorbing it all. The quiet croon of Elliot's singing voice mixed so close as to feel like he's singing directly into your ear. The quaint but emotive stories he's telling you, told over intimate acoustic guitars and the occasional drum keeping the energy from stagnating. Dissecting the record into its individual parts may be fun and pretty easy, but I feel pretty strongly that to do so is to do a disservice to the record. I think personally, it's an 8 for me. I don't have as much emotional attachment to this record as I do to others of his or the artists he influenced, but there's no denying that it's a powerful and important record that I would not even remotely begrudge you for saying is one of your all-time favorites. 
asking to stay Long enough for the clouds to fly on me away Rounding us out today is an album that Frankly, I couldn't wrap my head around the placement of for the longest time. I listened and enjoyed it, of course, but it kind of felt out of place to me amongst all this edgy and sad and angsty music to have something as soft and as beautiful and as intimate as this amongst all of it felt bizarre to me. Of course, I've mentioned that it fits in by being shrouded in the artist's untimely passing, but the thing with Grace is that Jeff Buckley didn't kill himself. There's no way we can interpret the words here as a warning sign about his mental health because the cause of death was wholly accidental. And yet the record is still completely shrouded in death. Perhaps then it's the tragic family history beforehand that brought on this practically cult status the record has accumulated. Jeff's father, Tim Buckley, was also a cult classic folk singer in the 60s before taking his own life at only 28 years old. It's not controversial to say that the parallels between the two are at least unsettling. The Buckley curse, as it were. It's a sound theory, and I think it definitely plays a major part in why the record feels so haunted by the ghost of its creator. Ultimately though, I think the music itself does its fair share of deliberation around life, death, and the meanings therein. Mojo Pin nearly desires death, it feels, while Lover You Should Have Come Over seems to mourn it. Eternal Life talks of a prison for the walking dead. But. Amongst all this death is also an obsession with the life-giving properties of the flesh, the act of feeling, the physicality of it all. The record is touching in both an emotional and physical sense, the obsession over his lover's dress on So Real, and the pledge of his kingdom for a kiss upon her shoulder. Carnal is the word here. It would be crass to call it horny because that ignores the deeper intimacy with which he understands his desire, as spiritual as it is physical. And spiritual is definitely the word to use for this album. Corpus Christi Carol and Lilac Wine both feel near biblical in scale, and the care with which they're performed feels truly reverent to something greater. All of this obviously pales in comparison, though, to the cover of Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. It's a track so universal that I bet at least one or two of you just found out now that it's not actually original, and for good reason, because this cover is absolutely phenomenal, reveling in the f every facet I've laid out for this record before, the ghostly haunt of its creator, the carnal desire of touch, and the spiritual adoration for a greater power and for the simple intimacy of the physical. In these seven minutes, without even writing any new lyrics, Buckley perfectly lends his voice to the mission statement of what would sadly be his entire career. I've not even mentioned any real musical elements, and I think that's because for as amazing and truly unmatched Jeff's voice was and how beautifully the instruments are arranged, they all fall away in light of the experience of this record. It's an eight from me. And that's another episode in the bag. This one may have been shorter than the last one, but I actually found it a fair bit more difficult to write because some of these records I was a lot less familiar than the others. At the same time, I also wanted to do what I could to get a little more conceptual and a little bit less straight, is it good or not, reviewer, as you likely saw towards the end there. As it stands, here's my personal ranking of the records discussed today and here's how they slot in ranked with the ones from the last episode. Aside from that, I've got a ton of cool material slowly making its way down the pipeline that I'm very excited to share with you, so keep on the lookout for that. Either way, I hope you found something to enjoy with this, and would love if you'd sub to me on YouTube, Patreon, or see me on Twitter. It feels kind of dirty to start using YouTube end card language, but you know what? <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> Have a good one.